So uh, let's start this uh, keynote session. Uh, my name is uh, Daming Chen, and uh, it's our uh, great uh, honor and pleasure to have Professor Jason Kang to present for the keynote speech. Okay, so let me uh, give a brief introduction of Professor Kang. So uh, he is the uh, Vaganao Chair for Engineering Excellence Professor and the former uh, department chair at the UCL, uh, UCLA Computer Science Department with a joint appointment from the Electrical Engineering Department. He is the director of Center for Domain Specific Computing and the director of uh, VISI Architecture Synthesis and Technology Lab. So Dr. Uh, Chong's uh, research interests include uh, novel architectures and the compilation for customizable computing, synthesis of VLSI circuits and systems, and highly scalable algorithms. He has uh, close to uh, 500 publications in these areas, including 16 best paper awards, three 10 year most influential paper awards, and the first paper inducted to the FPGA and the Reconfigurable Computing Hall of Fame. And uh, he and his former student uh, co-founded Auto ESL, which developed the most widely used hardware sensors tool for IPGA, and uh, uh, it's renamed as uh, Vavado Hardware Sensors after Xilinx uh, acquired the company. I'm sure many students have used the Vavado Hardware Sensors. Uh, it becomes uh, very popular, and amazingly, he actually co founded another company called the Falcon Computing that was acquired by Xilinx last year again. Okay, So he was elected uh, to uh, an IEEE Fellow in 2000, uh, ACM Fellow in 2008, uh, the National Academy of Engineering in 2017, and the National Academy of Inventors in 2020. And uh, he is also my former PhD advisor. Okay, Jason, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. All right, Damien, thanks for that very nice uh, kind of introduction. And uh, also I'd like to thank uh, organizers for inviting me to be here. Unfortunately, it has to be virtual, otherwise I'll be very much uh, looking forward to interact with the community more closely. So I'm going to talk about a more recent work uh, in my lab we're doing uh, related to compilation or data automation for quantum computing. Uh, Okay, so this is uh, the outline of the talk. I'll give a quick introduction, uh, especially uh, for people who are lack of some basic quantum computing background. And then I will talk about the, what's the opportunity there for uh, quantum compilation or design automation. Uh, and then talk about some of the now recent work in this area. Um, so first, uh, uh, people probably have been reading uh, the news articles recently. There's a lot of excitement and around the, the bounces in quantum computing. Uh, we start paying attention in this area around 2015, 2016. At that time, I remember the announced that quantum device was from UC Santa Barbara with four qubits. Uh, and then also shortly after that, I visit the Google, uh, the Venice site where they were actually doing the quantum computing work. But you can see this curve uh, actually is quite, uh, the progress is quite amazing. This is on the exponential side. We have a four qubit, eight qubit, 16, 32, 64. For example, both uh, IBM and uh, Google has uh, around uh, uh, 50 some qubits now. But, uh, um, this, uh, um, that's on the supercomputing, that uh, superconducting technology. There's also uh, startups like uh, Rigetti. Uh, it's also in the order of uh, uh, tens of qubits. Uh, on trapped ion technology, these are in the order of the 10 to 15 qubits. Uh, certainly, it's a, a lot of a progress just in the last few years. Uh, whether we can expect the exponential growth like a Moore's law, uh, it's yet to be seen, but uh, at least the promise is there, right? Um, so, uh, so you may wonder what can we do with quantum computer? Uh, it's actually has a, a lot of a potential. 
Uh, more, uh, all of us are very uh, familiar with classical computing, where you have zero bits and the one bits and the binary representation. Uh, in quantum computing, you also have a zero state and uh, the one state. Uh, however, a qubit can be in the superposition of any combination of them. Um, so, um, so it's not that just a zero and the one it can be also any combination. So, in this sense, that the these are just the two extreme point that uh, it's a combination of zero one right so zero will be represented as one zero one is uh, just a superposition only one to zero one um, but you can be in anything in between so you can have multiple qubits uh, multiple bits right in our case we get a bit stream uh, however that uh, if you have us uh, multiple qubits and you can come up with a uh, so-called tensor product and now you become a, a, a vector from two qubits, become a vector of a length four. And in general, if you have n qubits, then we get a, a, a vector of the two to the n. Uh, remember the two to the n is just the dimension of the, the Hilbert space. And then you can be in composition, linear comp uh, superposition of any of these uh, combination of this uh, uh, sort of a, uh, basic uh, dimensions. So that's why you get uh, 2 to the 2 to the m, that uh, the number grows very quickly. Um, so if you just have the, this representation, what can we do that uh, with that? Uh, you can also have very simple gates to manipulate on these qubits. For example, a very simple one is like a bit flip. You can take alpha, beta. Remember, alpha, beta is not just a 0 and a 1. It's actually any uh, numbers as long as Oh, they have to be normalized, so the alpha square plus beta square equal to one. Uh, but you can actually uh, flip that, so it corresponds to a two by two matrix operation. Uh, there is something called the Hadamard gate, and then you can take a, a alpha beta and go through this transformation, get a new vector. Uh, phase shift gate is very simple, that uh, um, then you can basically rotate it somewhat. Uh, there's two particular angles where uh, it's important to pi over two and pi over four, which I'll come to that. Um, uh, in fact, the IBM uh, KISS gate, the U3 gate, uh, can be very general. You can actually have three degree of freedom, theta, phi, and the lambda, and then to give you a, uh, a, a general, um, basically, uh, gate operation on, you can apply on any qubit. Um, it's not just a single qubit type of operation. You can also have cube, uh, two qubit operation. The, uh, the simplest one is really the control knob gate or the CX gate. What says, it basically says that if the first bit is zero, you don't do anything. So the alpha beta gate, alpha beta gate. If the first bit is one, and the second bit got flipped. So gamma delta becomes delta gamma, right? Um, what I want to say is that all these gates uh, are unitary. So basically, you can have um, this matrix multiply its uh, uh, transpose, uh, but also take the complex conjugate, and you get an identity matrix. That's the definition. So um, all these transformations are unitary transformations. That was a, a, a very interesting, also very important theorem, says that uh, you only need this very simple gates, the H gate, Hanuman gates, right? The P gates and the P gate, these are two special rotations, that uh, the phase gate, and then plus the CX gate. Uh, it can, it's universal for quantum computing. You can use it to do any quantum computation you want. Um, so that's uh, sort of the, a very, very quick uh, uh, three minutes introduction to quantum computing. You may say, wow, that's actually difficult. I don't write programs that uh, this way. Uh, I, I don't write it either. So what we hope is that the where now background comes in is that to do uh, data automation or compilation to take high level representation to come up with these primitive gates, right? Um, uh, like uh, most of you, my background is all on VSI design automation. So for uh, today, integrated circuits, we can design the very high levels. Deming talked about in our work on uh, high level synthesis. With high level synthesis, you can come up with a system specification in C, C++, or system C. And then we can compile it automatically into VHDL very long, right? And then you can further perform logic synthesis to get the logic gates that uh, 
these are the Boolean equations we learned in our digital logic design classes. These are generic Boolean equations. You want to minimize the number of literals. But the, when you go to TSMC or Samsung for fabrication, you have to actually map it to a particular uh, set of gate libraries. It's very similar to the uh, quantum gate libraries I talked to you. So that's actually the gate circuit design. And finally, you do place and route, you come up with the, the circuit, you do the fabrication, right? So, um, so that's the flow we are very familiar with. What I'm looking at is to see uh, whether we can use a similar flow and uh, to do quantum computation. So if you look at uh, what we can do with quantum computation, we start with applications. Uh, you have to solve some interesting problems, otherwise no one will buy quantum computers or use quantum computers. So in the near term, so these are some of the interesting applications. You can do simulation, uh, uh, chemistry simulation. You can do certain optimizations and um, machine learning is also being considered. Uh, cryptography, we also, uh, we all heard about it, right, to do uh, the prime factorization. Uh, once you have that, then it would do quantum algorithm design. Uh, this is a, a lot of that, it's just a linear algebra because you can see that uh, uh, all these gates can be represented by uh, matrices. Uh, so once you have that, now the next step is the logic synthesis uh, or equivalent of a logic synthesis. You want to map it to a sequence gate supported by the architecture. For example, IBM, Google, Regedi, they all have their own set of gates they support. There's a step I'm going to talk more uh, a lot in today's talk, so I call the layout synthesis. You have to decide uh, where to execute uh, this gate and at what time you execute this gate. Um, so you determine that basically space time coordinates of all the gates. And then finally, you come up with control signal that, uh, to uh, control that. So this will be waveforms uh, you're applying and then obviously you will be applying to some physical systems. So for my lab, and uh, so this can be superconductor qubits, trapped ion, uh, silicon based, or, or also optical uh, technologies. Um, so my lab on our research focused more on this part from logic synthesis all the way to uh, sort of the uh, control generation. Um, for, uh, I will talk about part of the research. For those of you who are interested to see more, you can go to the website I listed here. Um, so let's me, let me zoom in to talk about layout synthesis in, in particular. Uh, you can actually write a program uh, for quantum computing. Uh, so this is uh, a very simple program correspond to this circuit diagram, uh, which basically says this X gate, remember that's the gate flip, uh, the big flip one, uh, it's actually at the qubit Q0. And then there's another uh, gate flip, uh, big flip at the qubit one, right? Another uh, Hardamark gate at the qubit three. And then we do a C naught gate at uh, Q2 and Q3. So this is basically a assembled equivalent for quantum computing. And it will give you a circuit diagram to describe what are the other operations. So uh, we apply these operations from left to right, and uh, these are the uh, uh, time uh, sequences. Uh, you can label each gate by a number, so it's a Z and G0, G1, G2. Uh, but uh, that's just how your uh, logical program is written. Uh, you can actually execute it on some device, uh, quantum device. Uh, some device has only a few qubits. For example, this IBM QX2 has five qubits. Um, the, the largest one that uh, in terms of the uh, superconducting qubits, it's uh, probably uh, the Google Sycamore. That's, uh, I think IBM also have an equivalent device of uh, 53 qubits. So what you need to do is to decide which logical qubit is executed on which that the physical qubit. So you can do this mapping. You say, uh huh, I want uh, this Q0 to be on this device, uh, on this qubit, and the Q1 to be on this device. So if you do this mapping, then you can do the execution. Um, remember that this one, it's the first is X gate. You can apply the X gate here. The, you can also have a, a C now gate. At the, so this Q2, Q3, and the, you can actually have this operation. But then 
if you want to apply another uh, signal gate, this is actually between Q3 and the Q0. Now we have a problem because Q3 and Q0 are not adjacent. You cannot apply that directly. So what do you do? You can quit the computation or it can be a little bit more clever. You swap these two gates. Uh, you insert the swap gates and then now you can apply this operation at uh, uh, between Q0 and Q3, right? Uh, so this, C, uh, this CX or CNOT gates has to be on a pair of adjacent uh, qubits. Um, so this is the problem we have to address. You can see this is a very small example, but in general it can be quite complex. For example, this is a, a small adder gate, and uh, how do we map to that? Um, so the input is a circuit and also a device coupling graph. Basically that tells you that the, what pair of the qubits are adjacent to uh, have a two qubit operations. And then the output is the space-time coordinate of all the gates. And uh, you have to determine that uh, uh, at the what time and also at the which place each gate will be executed. The reason I call that the layout synthesis is that uh, for some of you are familiar with the uh, VSI terminology, first it's a layout, right? We determine the placement of these qubits. But it also has a synthesis uh, flavor because the scheduling uh, normally is part of a high level synthesis. In this case, we actually do it together with the, uh, the layout mapping. So that's why I call that uh, uh, layout synthesis. Uh, remember that uh, we also have to insert swap gates. Swap gates can be implemented by three CNOT gates. So, uh, but that's the detail, but you logically you have to swap two qubits. Uh, we have a number of objectives. You can minimize the depths, additional swaps, and fidelities. Um, so, uh, and then the constraints have got to execute all the gates, right? And then you have to got to respect the dependency. If certain uh, program statement happens first, and then you execute in the next statement after that's completed. So what I'm going to talk to you is that the, uh, the, some of the work we have done on first understanding the gap. How good is the existing layout since this tool work, uh, works, right? And the second one is that our own algorithm to that. And also there's implications on architecture evaluation. So let's talk about the gap analysis. Uh, I have a student uh, was very interested in working with me in this area to do compilation quantum computing, uh, uh, the, the design automation for quantum computing. So before we go, that uh, um, we actually did some survey and you have uh, already quite a number of uh, uh, methods to do this layout synthesis. Uh, you have a, a program, you can do that, you can model that by a dependency graph, you can do the, the uh, scheduling layer by layer, or you can do it in a more greedy way, uh, gate by gate, right? Um, you can also look at the dependency, how do you optimize, uh, formulate that and optimize the, uh, the program in more general way. And then there's also industry tools there. Remember these companies, they offer you quantum uh, devices for them. IBM, you can request account to run on IBM quantum computers. They have a compilation code, a tool called a keys kit. Uh, Riketti is a, uh, a startup company. They have their own that uh, Quill LC, Quill C, and then the Google, it's more recent, is a CERC. This uh, uh, ticket, that uh, is interesting. It's done by a startup uh, in Cambridge, UK. Um, so they, do, they don't own quantum computers, but they provide tools uh, for you to design quantum computers. So very natural question <laughs> before we jump in. I said, maybe these tools are already very good. Uh, there's no room for us to um, do any, write another paper to that. So the first thing is that uh, to measure how good they are. But if you look at the literature, these are all NP-hard problems. How do, how do we know that how far are, we, are they away from optimal solution? But then I, I will say, wait a second, we have addressed this problem that the VSI designed before. And for example, circuit placement uh, is an NP-hard problem. But uh, uh, we want to know how good is the existing circuit placement works. But just to remind you what circuit placement problem is that uh, you have a net list and with gates, they are all connected, right? If you want to place them on a 2D uh, 
surface, the grid, this is a silicon surface. And how do you measure the quality of the face mask? There's many ways you can measure. One simple way is to minimize the total wire length. How do you minimize, uh, measure the wire length of this uh, four pin net or the four gate net? So you use the, uh, the bonding box wire length. In fact, you use the half parameter of the bonding box. You take the maximum and the uh, X and Y locations, and then subtract the minimum X and Y locations. So in this case, the maximum x and maximum y is five. So you have five plus y minus like the three and minus three. So that's four, which is reasonable because this one spans right uh, two cells. That the horizontal direction to the vertical direction. So the half parameter of this bounding box is four. You want to minimize all the that the half parameters of all the nets. So that's the tricky part because all these nets interact with each other. Uh, there's various heuristics proposed, but for a long time, we do not know how well this heuristics works, right? So uh, uh, my lab actually come up with an interesting way to construct an arbitrary large circuit where we know the optimal solution. It sounds very fancy, but in fact, uh, once you understand the, the concept, uh, it, the method is quite straightforward. Uh, we go the other way, that uh, we construct the circuit we know the optimal solution. For example, you can say, hey, my circuit has uh, 64 two pin nets, basically, uh, right, that the uh, nets connecting two gates. So that's fine. I actually have um, my circuit, uh, 64 uh, circuit elements. I add these two pin connections. You can, you may say, oh, actually, I also have another 12 three pin connections. That's fine. I'm writing down the three pin connections this way. You said I also have some four pin connections, some five pin connections, but in general, that uh, for a n pin net connecting to n modules, right? I'm going to do the connection in this square root n by square root n uh, box. So obviously, this is the smallest possible bounding box you can have to accommodate this net. So by construction, this is optimal, right? Um, and the net degree distribution will follow exactly the industry benchmarks. In fact, 15 years ago or so that we have this competition, IBM contributed the circuit. In IBM circuit, you may have 97% two pin nets, 3% uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, 2% of three pin nets and 1% of four pin nets. So we will follow exactly the same distribution. And then we can construct the benchmarks up to two million placement gates. Two million, it was just a limit at that time uh, considered to be uh, state of art size. Uh, you can easily scale it. And then we use the circuit to measure both academic tool and the industry, industry tool. We find out, wow, there's a pretty big gap. It's 1.6x to 2.5x, which means that if the optimal wiring is one, some of the tools are producing 1.6 wiring or 2.5 wiring. So we publish the result. In fact, uh, get a lot of attention. Even EE Time has a, a feature article covering our research. It says that uh, placement tools are far away because uh, we also report the result on uh, industry tools. Um, so we made these circuits all available on the website and uh, a lot of download you can see from all the EDA companies, uh, the semiconductor companies, and also all the leading universities. Um, so this also generated a lot of interest. Uh, the optimal gap that uh, for Peco narrowed down to 20% after uh, three, four years. Not only are these artificial that uh, circuits, once you zoom in to focus on this problem, it also improved on real circuits. For example, this MPL was uh, the multi-level placer uh, from uh, my lab. And this, we see that being improved by 30% as we tune to address these uh, uh, PECO examples. Um, so 30% is quite a big deal. Remember, if you do more, one more slot uh, scaling, so you go from seven nanometer to five nanometer, you get about 30% wiring improvement. So this is just by optimization, we get that. So with that inspiration, so we says, okay, we want to do the same thing for quantum computing, that is it possible. It turned out for layout synthesis, we can apply very similar techniques. Um, 
So the input is the device graph. And um, so we're going to evaluate up to certain depths, right, the gate density. Um, so how do we do that? So how do we construct the circuits with optimal depths, quantum circuits with optimal depths? So this is your device graph. Let's say only uh, P0, P1, P1, P3, P3, P4, P2, P1, right? They can have connections. There's no other possible connections. So first step is that uh, we have a, we'll grow a so-called a backbone. Uh, so we have a, we grow a circuit with a dependency chain that, uh, for example, of depth three. So then in this case, you cannot collapse the circuit any further at the beyond um, below three. Um, so that's just a dependency chain. There's all other uh, space available at every time slot. So we'll sprinkle some other gates uh, based on the gate density profile, how many percentage of the single uh, cubic gates, how many percentage of the uh, two cubic gates. So we will actually populate that. And uh, then, of course, that uh, we're not going to tell you this particular layout, we're going to scramble that and to give you a different name of all the qubits. Then we come up with a circuit, we give you this program as the input, right? Uh, so this program is just the same as any other quantum uh, programs. We're going to evaluate the existing tools. So the tools that we evaluate, first the device we evaluate are these four kinds. This is a Rigetti device, uh, and uh, this is uh, the IBM Rochester device. This IBM Tokyo device, and this is a Google Sycamore device. Some of you have heard about this uh, quantum supremacy by Google. This obviously is a Sycamore device. Um, we try, we construct two sets of circuits. One is what we call near term feasible, because, for example, in this Google uh, uh, um, that the supremacy test, they, their circuit is about depths 40 to 50. So we think that might be feasible. And then we also have circuits. We can construct any depths we want, right? So, so 100 to 900. The density that uh, we follow the profile of our property case is a very important case, or the quantum supremacy experiment from Google. Um, and then the tool we evaluated, uh, we focus more on industry tools that serve from Google, KISKIT from IBM, KISKIT from Con uh, uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing. And also this paper in DAC 18, we chose it because I think they won a, a, a competition organized by IBM for the synthesis. So here's the result. I will say the result is quite surprising. Remember a VRSI case, now our gaps 1.6 to 2.5. But here, for example, on this Rigetti Aspen 4 device, the gap is between a, a couple of X all the way to 10 to 15 x right? So, um, and then on Google Sigmore, you look at this, that uh, this is uh, uh, CQC, this is the IBM, this is Google search. The gap goes from a few x all the way to 45 x. So this is a much gap, much larger gap. To us, it's very surprising because the circuit we generate are much smaller. There, we generate up to two million gates for uh, VRSI placement. Here, I will say that uh, if the depth is just, uh, um, this is all within at, uh, 40, 50. And the, um, if we do the scalability study, uh, we try larger circuit, that's also, um, the gap is still there. At, uh, uh, for example, we, this is a CQC, this is IBM, this um, and this is a depth ratio. Again, it's not the 2% or 8%. This is the 2x, 8x. It's very significant. So with this information that we say, so, wow, that's actually a lot of opportunities for optimization. So we zoom in to develop our own uh, optimal layout synthesis uh, algorithm. We call it the OLSQ, stand for Optimal Layout Synthesis for Quantum Computing. Um, so first, I want to um, convince you the problem is actually quite large. When we look at it, even with all the experience that we have with VSI uh, uh, automation, so this problem is because it combines the placement and the uh, uh, scheduling. Uh, there's hard work to deal with that. 
for example, in the SPAC 19 paper, is the optimal solution. So what it has is that uh, they focus on two cubic gates, which is fine because single cubic gates, you don't change the placement information. Two cubic gates, we swap, you can change that. So they introduce these binary decision variables, right? If logic qubit Q is mapped to physical qubit P um, at gate L, so then you have a, a one, otherwise you have a zero. So um, for example, you can have a, a, this uh, physical qubit zero mapped to, uh, uh, I mean logic qubit zero mapped to physical qubit two and at the right at the gate zero, and uh, you can actually uh, have a, a coordinate that uh, value to that. So this right away is uh, uh, two to the L two M and N. M is the number of uh, logical qubit, N is a physical qubit. L two is the number of uh, uh, two qubit gates. Not only that, uh, you also need to model the permutations we have. That the before and after the gate. The permutation, that's actually a much higher number, right? So, for example, you can actually, before this swap gate and after swap gate, the permutation changes. So, that needs to be encoded. So, right away, you get actually for each two qubit gates, then you get n factorial permutation variables can be affected by that. So, that's a need of pre computation to actually. Uh, record this information. So altogether, this is a very high complexity approach to the problem. Uh, with this simple uh, add circuit, uh, adder circuit, they already use over 1,500 variables. So in our method, we have a, a much more efficient, more compact uh, uh, state uh, that encoding for the problem. So here is uh, in our notation. Remember, I used the term uh, space time. So that's exactly how we encode the solution for each gate that uh, we have two variables. One is the uh, space variable. Uh, XL says that the work is going to be executed and TL is the time it will be executed. For single qubit gate, uh, the XL is just uh, the physical qubit is going to be mapped to. And uh, for two qubit gates, then the XL is an edge. And then we also have a mapping that uh, the Q, uh, so we want to know at time T, where is this uh, logical qubit Q is mapped to? So this is not a binary variable. This actually gives us a location, right? So uh, mapping of a logical qubit uh, zero and uh, at the time zero is three because it mapped to physical qubit three, right? Um, so that's the mapping we're talking about. It also uh, maps the, uh, at the time one, it's also mapped to three, right? And all the way until after a swap, it, uh, at the uh, logic to be zero, at time step eight, is now mapped to a cubic two now because after swap, at the P2, P3. So that's how we encode uh, the information. And then the final invoice N is still mapped to two. Um, we also uh, need to know that uh, have a, a special variable for the uh, swap. Basically it says at time P on this edge E, do we have a swap or not? Uh, if we have a swap, it's one. If we don't have a swap, that's actually a zero. So this is a binary variable. Uh, otherwise this uh, pi, X, T are not binary variables. Um, so if you look at this, this is a lot more uh, compact encoding. It's N to the M uh, uh, times T. It's still quite high, the complexity, but I remember compared to the previous one, that's the two to the M times N times T. So this is uh, more scalable. Uh, I will show you how we can reduce this complexity further. By the way, you don't expect a polynomial time solution uh, if you want to solve it optimally, because the problem is shown to be empty high. Um, so this is, uh, I'm just talking about, yeah, at the uh, edge P2, P3, we do have a, a swap which completing at time seven. So in this case, it's one, otherwise it's zero. 
Um, so what? How, so with these variables, actually we can model the objectives functions very easily. So what do we care about? One is that we care about the depth. So depth is just the maximum of all the PL. And also we care about the swap count. Remember, swap count is a binary variable. Do we have a swap at time P or not? We just add them all up together, so that gives the number of swaps. That's also something you want to minimize. And then there's uh, uh, the concept of minimizing or optimizing the fidelity, because not all the qubits are born equal. So there's this paper out of uh, Georgia Tech, uh, and also later on by Princeton, was quite revealing. If you measure the fidelity of every qubit in IBM devices, it changes by days, sometimes even by hours. So you want to redo the mapping uh, to optimize that. So the fidelity is the if the function if the circuit has to work correctly, you got to every gate has to work correctly, right? So you times the fidelity of all the measurement gate, fidelity of all the single qubit gate, fidelity of all the uh, two qubit gates, and all the fidelity of all the swap gates. So that's actually the overall fidelity. So it turned out uh, with our notation can be all model. Um, now you can say, what about the constraints? That uh, constraints also we can uh, model that fairly easily. Remember that at any time t that uh, that logic qubit uh, q will be mapped to some physical qubit t, right? So you have that, and also all the computation has to be finished by some time t. In fact, this t is something we're going to search. Um, it, it has to be. You can start with. Uh, uh, the the links, the maximum lengths of the dependency constraint, right? And uh, you can gradually re relax that if you cannot find a solution. So that's how we can get the optimal solution. And then uh, you also have to make sure that the validity of the uh, space coordinate, if the GL is a physical qubit, if it's a single qubit gate, or it's a two qubit gate, it has to be an edge, right, in the graph. Remember, you cannot do a two qubit operation on the non-adjacent uh, variables, uh, on non-adjacent qubits. So uh, uh, finally, you have to follow the de uh, dependency constraint. So if that uh, this gate happens before gate four happens before gate eight, then you also make sure that there's a dependency constraint that T eight that be larger than T four. Um, it should be a conject, uh, the injective mapping for two qubits. Uh, they cannot be mapped to the same physical qubit at the same time. So that's actually that the, the all the constraints we have. You can see these are all uh, low order polynomial time constraints. Um, then there's also you want to make sure some consistency among these variables. So mapping implies the space, space time coordinates. Um, so what happened here is that uh, if at the time zero, physical qubit zero is mapped to, that uh, I mean the logical qubit zero is mapped to physical qubit three, then um, so this one is going to be acting on this gate right at the time zero. So you will say, ha, huh, if we, at time zero this qubit is at P three, and uh, then this uh, the gate also happens. At the, at the P3. Um, so that's um, one type of constraint. The second type of constraint is about the swaps. So you can actually swap these two qubits. Uh, that's the initial swap. And But you can, uh, however, you can also swap two, these two qubits. That's fine. Except that, that they cannot be happening at the same time if they share a vertex or share a physical qubit. So in this case, you will say uh, if at time seven, uh, P2, P3 are already uh, doing a swapping, then P2, P0 cannot be doing a swapping uh, because they share uh, a common physical qubit. You're going to uh, enforce that. And also, you cannot allow uh, swap gates here uh, because there's a physical, there's a, actually a gate operation between P1 and P0. That uh, happen, so so that's not possible. So you, that also can be enforced for consistency. You can say, huh, if at the time that uh, eight, if at the time eight, that uh, you have a gate 
like a state of 10, right? This is state 10 between P1, P2. And the P1, P2, and the P0, that the P1 is, uh, has non zero interception, then you cannot have a swap on the, um, at this uh, time between the P0, P1. So you put in this constraint to guarantee that the all your specification or the representation are consistent. Um, so um, and then the final thing is that uh, once swap did happen, then you want to make sure you update that uh, your uh, variables. For example, originally this uh, logical qubit zero uh, at the time zero is mapped to P3, right? And uh, if there's no swap gates, it's still mapped to P3. However, at this time, at, uh, at time eight, because there's swap gate before that, you will say, huh, that uh, it's before that is P3, but there is a swap gate between P2 and P3, and that's equal to one at time seven. Then at the time eight, logical qubit zero is mapped to P2 now instead of P3. So you can actually uh, come up with this uh, con uh, cons consistent constraint so that uh, it's a, a true and uh, complete representation of the layout synthesis problem. Um, so if you look at the summary of the constraints, that the, so these are the uh, everything I talked about. So we end up to be N times T times L, and it's number of uh, uh, physical qubit, T is the execution time, and then the L is the number of gates. So in comparison, that the prior work was using N as a, a logical qubit, which can be not larger than physical qubit. And then there's an N factorial because they have to model the permutation. And then the, um, they only care about the two input gates, so you have the L2 instead of the L. Um, so the key advantage, as I said, now we have only polynomial number of constraints, um, so it's a lot more efficient. Uh, there's also an implication on the complexity result. Um, now the problem, it can be easily shown to be NP because you come up with a proposal that can verify that very easily in polynomial time. Not, uh, not only that, uh, many of the previous heuristics, they will process either layer by layer or gate by gate. It's dependent on the initial gate input order. But in our case, we model it as a graph. We model the dependency directly. We don't have to worry about uh, the force dependency is introduced. So in this case, if you do it the layer by layer processing, you actually, or gate by gate processing, you introduce these uh, pseudo constraint. Um, they are not there just because the ordering you follow, uh, the, the, this algorithm follows, so they introduce uh, these dependencies. So this is actually, uh, uh, it's already a very significant reduction, but I want to uh, improve the runtime further. Um, let's see how we can do that. Um, so you, you probably noticed that many mapping variables uh, are redundant because the qubit is mapped to a physical qubit. It will stay there for a long, long time until we do a swap, right? So then the idea is that uh, we can say, hey, can we come up with a, a, a higher level abstraction? Uh, the qubit will stay there until we do a swap. So here is a circuit. If you look at it, maybe we can create, in, uh, divide it into a blocks, uh, block zero and block one. The definition of block is that uh, the coordinate within the block will not change the mapping from logical to physical qubit. They only change after we insert uh, a swap gate, right? So the uh, the understanding is that the number of uh, these uh, uh, blocks are much, much fewer than the time step. So the variables, now that we can still have a mapping space time swap for each block instead of for each time step now. Um, so now we reduce it to two blocks uh, instead of uh, 14 times that for this very simple example. Uh, the reduction can be more dramatic when we come to larger examples. Um, after the swap, and uh, we did not specify how things are scheduled, then you can just do as soon as possible scheduling because it doesn't affect the optimality anymore uh, if you don't consider the swap. You still need to observe the dependency. Right? 
So in taking this view, and uh, I can modify my mathematical programming formulation slightly. In fact, uh, um, uh, in modality, I changed the bound to be the number of blocks I can have. And uh, uh, mapping, injective mapping, there's no change. Uh, you cannot map the same physical qubit. Dependency, now remember that uh, if you are in the same block, you will get the same block number. So uh, it changes from larger than to larger or equal to. Um, mapping uh, of the constraint for space-time coordinate, there's no change. Uh, mapping over swap, no change. And uh, so it's not required anymore because swap, we model that separately. So there's no overlap that, uh, between swap with the original gates. And uh, mapping transformed by the swap, uh, there's no change. Um, so if you look at this way, and uh, now we reduce it uh, further because the B in practice is a constant. So we can go from NTL to NL. Uh, you compare it to the previous work, that's a big reduction, right? That uh, you have an exponential term here with all polynomial. And moreover, it's only polynomial that the physical qubit, which is very limited, you know, it's somewhere between 5 to 50 at this point, 53, and uh, L is the number of gates we have. Um, so here is a result that uh, first uh, having this uh, transition base, I call that uh, OSS2, is a big improvement. 400x plus an improvement on runtime on the circuit we have. Well, we compare it to a uh, ticket uh, that they, remember this is an uh, like independent commercial tool used for layout synthesis. And also, in our evaluation on this optimality test, they seem to have the best results, so we can tell with them. Um, on this small circuit to verify the optimality, and uh, for large arithmetic circuits, for Quackle circuits, we have somewhere between 50% to 100% reduction. Uh, for Quackle, when I say 100% reduction, is that uh, uh, for Quackle circuit, you can actually get a solution with zero swap. Right, that uh, we can or achieve that, they cannot, so that's why um, it's 100% reduction. Now with this uh, transition-based method, now our runtime is comparable to a heuristic method from the, this tri Q is from Princeton, that uh, was a state-of-art uh, uh, layout synthesis tool. We and they focus on fidelity, so we measure on fidelity. Uh, we get a, a 1.7x to all the way to 2.1x reduction. That all the improvement on fidelity. Um, oh, I want to mention is that there is a more recent work just presented uh, maybe two or three months ago. They used A star search with a uh, admissible heuristic. For those of you who know, if you can guarantee a admissible function, you do get the optimal solution. So their method is optimal for depths, uh, but we don't see a way to be. Uh, to generalize our method to swap count or fidelity. Um, but I want to mention that, uh, still I want to mention it because the runtime is uh, a lot of uh, further improvement. Um, so what are some of the interesting applications we can do with existing quantum computers? Uh, it's actually optimization I mentioned earlier is a, a significant problem. Although I use the adder as an example, uh, arithmetic, uh, Operations not a strong point of a quantum computer at this point because we can do it so well with a classical computer. Um, optimization um, is, uh, uh, I mean, I uh, have many, many applications. I think a lot of our CAD people care about that. So, one well known problem is the graph maximum cut. I know some of you uh, or some of us work on mean cut problem, but the max cut is equally important and also difficult. So how can we cut the circuit so the cut size is maximized? Um, so it turned out that we can model that with uh, uh, binary variables, uh, zero and one, um, in this case, plus one, minus one. Um, the way we have that is that uh, we just want to minimize this uh, metric, sum of all the summations over all edges that you have the Z, J, Z, K if ZJCK is the edge. So why that works? Because think about it, if ZJ and ZK are in the same partition, so either they are plus one, both of them plus one, or both of them are minus one, so you get a one, so you, you, this term becomes zero. 
So this can become one only if one is in one partition, another one is in another partition because you get a minus one times one, you get a minus one. So this one give you a contribution of one. Uh, so that's why by summation over all edges uh, with this expression, I can see how many are being cut. It turned out uh, this representation, you can think about the electron had two spins on the up and down. So that's a very direct mapping to the uh, quantum circuit uh, representation. Um, and then um, this ZJ, ZK can correspond to two cubic gates or the ZV phase gate. Um, so the, this ZZ phase gate, actually, if you look at it further, it's a, a diagonal gate. That, uh, if it's a diagonal, that's this nice property is uh, commutable. So A, B, uh, A times B equal to B times A. So in this case, then it's interesting. If you look at this uh, circuit, um, for example, Google is working on this problem. They just had a, a publication earlier this year in Nature Physics. Um, you have this long dependency chain. However, remember I talked about that these gates are all commutable. And in this case, that uh, you can permute them that uh, to get a representation of this kind or realization of this kind, the depths will be smaller. So how do we model this degree of freedom? It turned out in uh, that in our uh, OS, uh, OSQ algorithm, we can specialize it for uh, uh, quantum optimization, uh, QAOA. So we actually now have two kinds of uh, dependency. One is uh, a fake dependency. I call that just a collision. Um, if they share some qubit, obviously you cannot place them at the, uh, executing the same time unit. However, if this one and the, this one has no shared qubits, then they can actually be executed at the same time. So we will relax the constraint in this case. But there are some dependency, for example, after this qubit, then you do the measurement, and uh, then, and, uh, or before this qubit, you have to do a Hardman gate to, uh, to apply to all the qubits. So this is a really hard dependency constraint. So by this relaxation, we can still solve it optimally. We can show that we have a 70% reduction on depth and a 55% reduction that uh, with uh, uh, take it on, on this uh, QAOA uh, examples. In fact, the Google is was relying on take it to do the uh, optimization for them. So before I end, I want to mention some uh, ongoing work. So so far, I focus only on lot uh, the lot, uh, layout synthesis. But you you may say, okay, what about the logic synthesis? It's a much harder problem, but we're looking into that. Uh, so first, uh, programmable single qubit gates that, that can be uh, configured into this form. That uh, remember that the IBM has a device that uh, programmable qubit gates allow you to implement. The, uh, 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 sorry, a programmable single qubit gates to implement any of this unitary transformation of size two. Um, so if that's the gates that uh, we also have a native. Uh, CNOT gates. That's very simple. Just look at the first qubit, just zero, don't do anything. It's one, you swap, right? That, that, uh, uh, you flip the second qubit. So with this, then you can show that uh, any of these uh, um, two qubit gates that uh, can be implemented using three CNOT gates plus these uh, programmable single qubit gates. Um, because you can collapse as many of them as possible, as necessary. Moreover, that uh, when you apply to real applications, so it's possible you have uh, some ZZ gate followed by swap gates, then a swap gate can be absorbed into that, so to speak. So if you look at this Google work uh, published this year in Nature Physics, uh, that's how they do it, that uh, they actually this is a complete graph. They can do it in exactly the n layers. The trick is that they will combine the ZZ gate with swap gates. That uh, uh, the advantage of doing that combination is that you only need the three native two qubit gates plus single qubit gates. 
However, if you do swap gates uh, alone, you need three qubit gates. Easy gate alone, you need two, uh, two, two qubit gates. So the summation is larger, right? But uh, that's for a complete graph. But it's not clear how you do that for three regular graphs, uh, which they also reported in their paper. Three regular graphs means that every degree has three, um, but you have some connections that there and some connections are missing. So in our case, we can show um, by considering this kind of uh, optimization. So you can see this is a limited degree of a logic synthesis because I can restructure the circuit somewhat. I can get additional 35% reduction in depth and 65% uh, uh, reduction swap. So this is the paper we submitted to uh, that uh, make a submission recently. Uh, similarly, that uh, uh, this problem also ha happens in chemical simulation. Um, we we show that uh, there's a substantial improvement you can have that uh, uh, with this kind of absorption that to come out with much simpler uh, electron structure. So in summary, that uh, um, to conclude, um, I think uh, there is a very exciting and significant progress that uh, in quantum computing device technology recently. Uh, and then from our study, we think there's a great need for better development or compilation tool for quantum computing. Um, so the objectives uh, at the near term can be uh, in these three areas, uh, circuit depth, overall fidelity, and uh, also scalability. The program should run fast enough uh, to handle the current workload. Uh, NISC stands for a noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. Uh, so that's why fidelity is very important. Uh, later on, we're going to add error correction. So fidelity probably will be less of a problem, but the overhead for error correction is way too large you know, for the current scale of quantum computing devices. Um, uh, the the OLSSQ provides an optimal solution for layout synthesis. By the way, this is open source. Uh, I welcome uh, any of you to further improve the algorithms. And uh, I think there's further opportunity to combine that with layout synthesis. Uh, in general, I see there's a lot of opportunities we can apply the compilation, these automation techniques uh, at, uh, for quantum computing. So with that, uh, uh, with that, I stop here and I uh, want to thank all the uh, industry partners who supported the part of the research. Mm -hmm. Let me back to you. All right, Jason. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting and uh, exciting uh, keynote. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, right? And uh, looks like EDA can play a critical role here. Okay, uh, given the optimality study you you provided, right? So up to 50x gap, <laughs> that, that's large. Uh, so uh, I think we have uh, some time, about five minutes, uh, for question and answer. And before I read the uh, uh, questions from the chat window, uh, I have some high level questions. Uh, uh, you know, hopefully this also represent uh, the audience, uh, uh, you know, high level questions. So first of all, um, I know quantum computing, you know, the qubits have uh, intrinsic um, noise, right? They are error prone. Right, so what do you think? Are they severe enough uh, to prevent uh, uh, the the wide adoption of this computing uh, kind of um, uh, platform? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good uh, comment. Uh, first, I think uh, the fidelity has improved a lot. I think for single qubit, probably it's over 99% now. And the two qubit is uh, over 98%. I'm just talking about uh, this uh, superconducting that uh, technology, right? Um, uh, but it's still not, not perfect. That's why we care about the, the depths, so that the, the longer that uh, you wait, that uh, so first there's a danger that uh, it can become uh, decoherent, and also if you go through so many that level of depths, the error can compound, can accumulate. Um, but also you'll see that uh, the kind of optimization uh, the application we're uh, looking at, uh, the absolute accuracy may not be so important. For example, that, uh, taking optimization into consideration. If I can find a maximum cut, which is 1% uh, within optimal, I probably would be very happy that uh, because the uh, using method are all heuristic anyhow, right? So if I can actually be 
there to solve it uh, quickly, that uh, is close to optimal solution. That's important. That uh, chemical simulation is another area. Uh, fracturization, although it's exciting, I think that has to come later because that you need error correction because you do need the exact solutions of uh, uh, mm -hmm. the two factors, right? Right. Right. So, so uh, we know actually FPGAs uh, have this uh, intrinsic tolerance, right? So if you run into error, you reconfigure. So then it's interesting. This cubic, uh, you know, uh, can be reconfigured as well. Do you see like a quantum FPGAs uh, to emerge? Actually, uh, so what I'm looking at the quantum computing is very similar to FPGA because uh, it's not saying when we say we, you don't design a new quantum. Computers, right? You write a program, you uh, map it to an existing quantum computer. It's very similar to FPGA design. We don't design it. When we say we design a new FPGA, no, we never create a new FPGA. We, you buy an FPGA from Dynamics or Intel, but you just reprogram, right? Like that. So, in that sense, it's very similar. Got it. Okay, great. So let me, um, you know, read some uh, questions from the audience very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Right. So uh, from uh, Srinivas, uh, how how do you verify the correctness of the synthesis result? Oh, so I did not give the detail. The uh, once we have all these uh, um, that the uh, variables and the constraints. Actually, we give it to SMT solver. That uh, the solver is an industry proven solver that the. Uh, in our case, we're using Microsoft Z3 solver, so that's actually uh, took care of that part. Um, but the key contribution is that we want the representation to be as compact as possible. You can see we have been trying to reduce the verb, number of variables, number of constraints, so that can finish. Right. Okay. All right. Another question uh, from Si Yuan. So, uh, does uh, O uh, let's say OLSQ use some specific solver. Actually, you already answered this question. So given the constraint and cost function, so then uh, how long does the solver take to produce the final result? Um, this SMT solver is like an SAP solver, right? It can mm -hmm. be very efficient for many instances, but uh, ultimately it is uh, solving an MP hard problem. It can explode. But, uh, so that's why I'm saying that scalability is still important. And for all these uh, small, I mean, for this medium size instance, small to medium size, you can just finish in seconds or minutes without a, a problem. But, but if you go to a scalability test, we do see cases can run for hours. Mm. But that's not the, the scale of the problem we're addressing today. <laughs> Uh, today we only have, uh, let's say, 53 qubits. We can have uh, at, uh, maybe 40, 50 layers. So that's the complexity we're doing. Right, right. And uh, you know, I <laughs> since I'm chairing this session, let me ask the last question. So we know the design reuse, you know, IP-based design is the key, right, to save cost and uh, improve the productivity, scalability. Do you think this can be applicable to the quantum circuits? Yeah, I, I, I definitely. I think uh, probably w uh, with some sacrifice of optimality, but you can reuse this, right? In fact, um, there's a nice paper uh, from the U of Chicago, Frank Chong's group, also at ASPLOS early this year. Uh, for these uh, two in, uh, three inputs of uh, uh, gates, they can come up with uh, optimal designs first, and then when you see them in a circuit, you move them as a group. You don't actually move each individual and do this. Uh, of course, you may argue maybe if you kind of smash them and uh, into pieces, you can do a better optimization, but uh, having some uh, hierarchical representation, I think it makes a lot of sense. You can uh, further reduce the complexity. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jason. Right, so excellent talk and.